Kia ora. I'm a very lucky guy. I get to direct what is uh, described by others, for fear of appearing immodest, um, is the best and most detailed study of human health and development that's ever been undertaken anywhere in the world. It's held up as the gold standard for research of this kind. And uh, in thinking about today's talk, I thought, well, how do I distill what I believe are the key features that make it so unique and special in the world? An international treasure. Uh, it boils down to three things. There are many others, I suppose, but the three things that spring to mind for me are um, this group of 1,037 people who were born in 1972 in Dunedin and have been measured on every conceivable thing since they were born, repeatedly as they have aged. They are now all turning 40, so it's been going for four decades. There's been 13 assessments from birth through to uh, today. And by every conceivable thing, I'm talking about their relationships, their antisocial behaviour, their drug use, their sexual behaviour, their lungs, their gums, their hearts, uh, their criminal record. Uh, on and on and on it goes. Um, this 1037 uh, uh, group uh, have uh, pretty much all stuck with this project. So at phase 38 or age 38 assessment, which we completed a couple of months ago, we saw 96% of the living cohort. Now that's a world record by some 30 odd percent. Uh, and the reason I'm telling you that is because the major threat to the value or the validity of these life course projects is what they call non-random loss to follow-up. In other words, the people that drift away first and are hardest to find and then get back in are not a random group. Uh, it won't surprise you to know that these are people in whom multiple problems aggregate. These are people that don't have a fixed abode, who are in and out of institutions, who don't have a cell phone, who are maybe running from the law. Uh, but those are the exact people you want to get if you want to understand the breadth of human experience, bad exposures, and what that does to people's life trajectories. We keep them in. Most of the world's other studies, and therefore the world's knowledge about human health and development, is based on the easiest to keep 50% or 60%. This sets the Dunedin study up to ask and answer very important questions about human health and development that no one else can even begin to approach because we've got everyone still involved. That's the first reason I think it's held up as a gold standard. The second is the founders of the study 40 years ago had the prescience to found the study as a multidisciplinary study. Now every funder these days with their salt understands that if you're going to fund research about why human beings turn out the way they, they do, you need to fund research that takes a holistic picture, is broad, because the brain talks to the immune system, the immune system talks to the gut, the social world gets under the skin to cause physical rot. But they didn't know that 40 years ago. In fact, they had to almost invent the word multidisciplinary way back then. So we have enormous breadth and it's like starting the 100 metre, you know, it is the time of the Olympics, 100 metre dash um, uh, at the 40 metre line, where 40 years got data, high quality, broad data in the bank. The third reason I think uh, people envy us uh, is because of the depth of measurement. It won't surprise the Kiwis in the audience to know that 25% uh, 250-odd people now live outside New Zealand. About 7%, 70-odd, live in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, about 17, 18% in the uh, West Island. Uh, for those viewing from overseas, that's known as Australia otherwise. Uh, and we have to bring these people back to the research lab in Dunedin every six years now. We don't ring them up and ask them a few questions. We don't mail out postal questionnaires. We bring them back to the Dunedin lab from wherever they are. You can imagine being in London right now, trying to climb up the corporate ladder in the city, and you get a letter from Richie that says, please, Phase 38's coming around, would you mind getting on uh, Air New Zealand, coming all the way back, bring your two children if you have to, uh, take half your annual leave, because effectively that's what it takes, about a week here and there and back, on cattle class. Who's done cattle class lately? 
nightmare, right? I mean, it may have been a perk when they were 21. Uh, and in fact, they used, to, they used to joke about going to Peru and just waiting for us to call them back and pay for it. But no longer. What it is, what's the commitment about? It's a reservoir of ex- extraordinary goodwill that we are the guardians of here. So, when we bring them back, we've got them in a lab. And we can do all sorts of clever things when you've got people in a, in a uh, controlled environment. We can take pictures of their retina and measure the microvasculature, because that relates to the overall vasculature and tells you something about cardiovascular risk. We can get the dentist to probe their gums and tell us about the gum disease. We can take measures of lung function in a really fancy body box where they huff and puff and do all sorts of uh, manoeuvres. We can sit face to face with them and ask them about all sorts of intimate aspects of their life. Uh, And of course we get to either make or break that relationship that we've established to that point. Eight hours. They spent eight hours, no stone unturned. We get to ask them thousands of questions about anything and everything. We poke and prod. But they put up with us doing this with good humour and grace. So those three things make us special. High retention, the integrity of the cohort's been maintained, incredible breadth of measurement and incredible depth. So we are very special. 1,100 publications have come out. That's one every 13 days every year for the last 40. So we've been productive as a scientific group. But I'm not going to talk about uh, the science. Stuart uh, requires me to talk about how I have developed alongside this work. One of the things that that scientists are very keen to ensure is that their observation of their subject, in this case it's people, does not adversely impact upon the focus of the observation. It's an observer problem. We haven't had that. We've got data to prove that. But the irony here is that the reverse has occurred. I have been changed. The observer has been changed by the observee. How has this study changed me? Well, it's given me a deeper, um, more uh, nuanced understanding of concepts that we bandy around and somewhat blithely. Three things spring to mind. Altruism, trust and courage. Altruism. I've just described how we fly everyone back from wherever they are. Uh, At phase 38, or the age 38 assessment, we had one study member who was located in the Northern Hemisphere who was unfortunately dying of a brain tumour. But this person, before they died, was keen, absolutely keen, to participate in the assessment phase. And they put themselves through hell with their husband to travel five hours by train to a large metro centre uh, where we set up an equivalent lab so they could give one more time. I don't need to say much more about that, do I? It's very humbling. They died two months after that assessment. Trust. You all know yourselves how hard it is to trust about things that are private to reveal your vulnerability. Uh, This group of a thousand people have stripped themselves bare for us time, time, time again. In every way, they tell us about the voices that others can't hear or the things that others can't see. They tell us about about sexual abuse that they have told no one else about ever. They trust us. And we honour that trust. We'll die in a ditch to to ensure their confidentiality and privacy. Uh, So to the point where the chair of the ethics committee before an assessment asked us to sign a document that said, if a court ever subpoenaed a study member's records, we would be, go in contempt of court to ensure that no information would ever leak and that in theory that could involve a fine or even jail. We happily signed. In fact, 
to be honest, quite secretly, I was hoping that that might happen because it was very romantic, the idea of going, <laughs> going to uh, jail for my research. Uh, courage. This is the thousand people. It's an all walks of life cohort. There was no selection. And we, and it won't surprise you to know, we have people who um, have soaked up so much punishment it would make your eyes water. These are people who have, from the time they were conceived, been putting up with crap. Mum smokes, drinks, takes all sorts of substances. When they finally get into the world, they are treated like muck. They are abused in every conceivable way. Then they perpetuate that cycle in adulthood, and they end up being bashed around by not only those close to them, but essentially by society. It is a never-ending grind of adversity and unpleasantness. Yet these people get out of bed, come down and see us from wherever they are, and they front up and they're incredibly giving, honest, and that takes courage, and they are pleasant. These are very nice people. Uh, they would have every right to be anti and to say, what am I doing that for? Really, I don't personally benefit much. In fact, it hasn't helped me a hell of a lot. I still get dumped on. But they do it as a group because they believe it will help others. That's an extraordinary thing. Altruism, trust, and courage. Those are things that I now understand through the lens of a thousand lives. I can also tell you that if I put a thermometer just below the surface, there's a hell of a lot of pain out there, a lot of anguish in ordinary people's lives. We cover it up and we soldier on. Am I meant to answer that? I'm feeling the pain now. So I have a, I have a, I have a, I mean, I, this sounds um, a bit, a bit cocky to say this, but I feel I have a little bit more wisdom than I would have had otherwise. And it's been gifted to me by these people. How has it changed me as a person? Um, well, and just picking up where I left off with that story of those difficult, damaged lives. Uh, in research, we talk about resilience. Now, it's a very trendy concept, a very appealing concept. And the way we measure research is we take people who have had adversity, and despite that adversity, they've ended up doing very well. And we measure what well looks like. So they're in good nick health-wise, physical, m emotional. They've got a good job. They're parenting well. Everything looks like it's humming along. And we say, these people have resilience. Let's try and bottle that and spread it around, right, for those that aren't doing so well. Um, I think that that is wrong-headed. I think the people that are displaying the most incredible resilience and therefore are worthy of the most respect are those people who drag themselves out of bed each day. They look into the mirror and they see essentially what is testament to a life of failure and unhappiness and hurt, and they still have the guts to get on with things and get on and try. So when we study resilience, and we're going to do this next time we see our, our group when they're 44, we're not going to do the straightforward, obvious stuff. We're going to come at this in a totally different way to try and dig below and see what's really there in terms of the ingredients of how human beings can withstand the slings and arrows that life throws. Uh, the academics in the audience will know that academia can be a pretty petty place. <laughs> academics will, there'll be blood on the floor about who's going to be first author on this paper. I mean, the coin of the realm is publication, right, in the research world. Um, and uh, you've got a, a strange combination of ego and brain in academia. Powerful combo. Uh, but it does result in um, uh, pretty uh, unpleasant behaviour at times. The, the contingencies that we operate um, according to the, the, the normal kind of the, the yardstick 
of achievement involve research monies and publications and ideally some medals uh, and uh, acknowledgement from your colleagues. That means you end up with a shiny CV and you may have had actually had very little um, impact on the world, the real world, outside the ivory tower. Now remember why our study members put themselves through everything that they do? It's because they want to make a difference. They want to help others. So Richie, at least, now knows that the end of my career, whether it's good or bad, will be judged not on the number of publications I have or the number of medals I have or the other types of gongs you can get, but on the difference I helped ensure was made by getting outside the ivory tower, talking to the politicians and the policy makers, talking repeatedly if I have to, about what's right, what the data, what world-class data tell you is right. And telling people without fear or favour um, uh, how they should spend their money, independent of, the, of politics and other whims. That's how I'm going to spend the rest of my career. Some of my colleagues think I'm crazy. They think I should just keep on publishing papers and shining my already shiny CV. Um, I find that to be a very empty goal. The last thing, we've heard about what artists are meant to do. They're meant to bring beauty into the world. These thousand lives have given me a, uh, a, a, the ability to understand uh, more intensely, I, th I think, um, the beauty that exists in the world. The, uh, the beauty, I mean, I used to love music uh, when I was younger and I've kind of drifted away from it. I'm going back to it. And probably uh, it, it's just coincidence that the other day I was listening to uh, Leonard Cohen and I think there was a song there that summed up um, really what I'm getting at here, which is essentially boils down to the dignity of the human condition. And it's a song uh, called Anthem. The lyrics, the chorus is, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. Enough said.